So today's the last week in our series thinking about hope. Back in the first week we looked at what our hope is founded on, that it's founded in the character of our God. That's the bedrock that our anchor is embedded into, that the character of our God is steadfast love and faithfulness and he will not fail. Then in the second week we looked at Jesus who came to give us hope in the form of a person and we saw that he was human just like we are and he knows how it feels to struggle with things and have difficulty and pain in our lives. Then in the third week we saw in 1 Peter that we have hope for beyond this life, that this life is not all there is and there is hope for us now because we are shielded and sustained in all the things that we're experiencing now. By his love. Then in the fourth week we thought about scripture, that scripture is given to us to help us sustain our hope. Beth reminded us that we have a real tendency to forget the things we ought to remember and that we remember the things we ought to forget and that's so true isn't it? Scripture is there to refocus us back on the things that we need to remember, to remind us what's important and what will sustain us. And then last week, Carl reminded us that our hope is formed through perseverance, through the strengthening of our character by holding on in faith and not losing heart, even when it seems like we're faced with a wall. And now in our last week on this theme, we're going to look at Paul's prayer for the Ephesian church in Ephesians chapter 1. It's possible that Ephesians was written as a circular letter that was intended to be passed around several different churches. Each of them are fledgling little churches. They're still finding their feet and finding their identity. And all of them are located within the greatest pagan empire that the world has ever seen. And that empire is hostile and suspicious towards them. Life is hard for these Christians. They're a tiny minority within this huge, vast, powerful world. And they're surrounded every day with reminders and symbols of the power of the Roman Empire around them. To those people in their little starter Christian communities, Paul writes this most beautiful prayer. I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 1 and I'm reading verses 15 to 19. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word, which is here to encourage us, to lift us up when we fall down, and to hold us and sustain us through wilderness times. As we think on these things now, will you come and open us up so we can truly hear your word to us today? May your powerful word have real power today through the Holy Spirit and may our hearts be stirred and changed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So our passage today is a prayer. It's a prayer that Paul prays for the Ephesian church and it's always interesting to notice what Paul doesn't pray for when he prays for the early Christians. He doesn't pray that they'll have a comfortable life. He doesn't pray that all their troubles will be over or that they'll be free from fear and danger. That's not what he prays for. What he prays for is that they might know. He prays for a spirit of wisdom and revelation so they might know God better. And he prays that the eyes of their heart will be enlightened so they can know the hope that they have in Christ and the hope that God has called them to. So let's look at this more closely. Let's look first at this spirit of wisdom and revelation that Paul prays for. Well, what's that? 
Well, revelation means something that is revealed, something that was previously not known, hidden from sight, but then it's revealed and becomes visible, like lifting a cloth that's covering something. You may think that you're able to tell what's under this cloth, but you can't really, not in any detail. You only know in the most general terms what it is. You don't know what make or model it is or what colour it is or what features it's got. But imagine the cloth being lifted and what's underneath being revealed so we can see much more fully what it is, what make and model and colour it is. We can walk up to it and touch it. We can sit inside it and see what it feels like to drive it. That's what this kind of revelation means. It's an unveiling so we can see and understand so much more about it than we did before. So what is it that Paul wants the cloth to be lifted from, to be revealed to us so we can fully see it and understand it? Well, he tells us that in verse 18. There are three things. What he wants to be revealed to our eyes and our understanding is the hope that we've been called to. Our identity as God's people and his children and the incredibly great power that is his and is also ours. So let's look first at number two and number three. In a difficult and challenging world, we need to know deep in our hearts who we are and who we belong to. We need to know what it means to be God's people. That it's not just a nice idea, it actually means something and makes a difference in reality. And we need to understand that our God is powerful. He's not feeble. He's not a God of words only or a God who is stuck in the past. He is a God of power and he uses it. Look at verse 19. I pray also that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. And it goes on to say, this is the same almighty power that raised Christ from the dead. Our God has power over death and over everything that could come against us. And it says that that power is for us who believe in him. It's not something that God keeps for himself and only gets out of the cupboard on special occasions. I think we often struggle to see God as he really is in terms of his power and his willingness to use it to act in our lives and to be at work in our lives and our circumstances. If we have a weak view of God, and I think we do have a tendency for that, if we have a weak view of God, then we will have a weak faith, a feeble relationship with him and a barely alive view of what he can do. What do you believe he can do? What do you believe he will do when you're faced with mountains that are just too high to get over? Is your view of God one of weakness? or disinterest that he's not really interested? Or is it one of power and of personal, intimate interest? Paul is praying that these Christians will come to know deep in their hearts who it is who's redeemed them and what that means. And for us, we need to know, especially in the busyness of our lives, all the stresses and worries and challenges and demands, we need to not lose sight of this. We need to know it and hold on to it for all we're worth. We need to know who it is who has redeemed us, who it is who loved us enough to do that for us and who loves us still and always will, who it is who has rescued us and who stands beside us no matter what. And we need to know his power we need to know deep within our being, within our very awareness, that our God who has rescued us and loved us stands with us. He stands beside us and he is powerful. 
He has the power to hold us, to sustain us, to get us through, to act on our behalf and to pour his grace into our lives. Let's go back again to verse 17, where we started by talking about revelation, about things being revealed. Because it's not just revelation that Paul talks about. There are two things that will lead us to this knowing. He says a spirit of wisdom and revelation. So we've understood what the revelation is, but what about the wisdom? What's that? Well, it's about allowing it to make a difference. The revelation is to have our eyes and our awareness opened up to the greatness of God and his power. The wisdom is to know what to do with it. Revelation is to be able to see what God reveals to us. Wisdom is to live it out, to actually live in the light of it. Revelation to understand the truth. Wisdom to apply it, to allow it to shape who we are and how we think. So it's the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Or perhaps it should be revelation and then wisdom to apply it. That's what enables this knowing that Paul is really praying for. He prays that God may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. In scripture, knowing God is never just about intellectual knowing with your brain. It's knowing of the heart. It's experiencing it for yourself. I can give you a jar of honey and you'll know in your head that there's honey inside the jar because the label tells you. And you may know something about honey. You know that honey comes from bees and you may know which shelf in the supermarket to find it. You may know if you're a scientist that honey is made up of 80% sugars, natural sugars and 20% water. You may even know if you're very scientific that honey is the only food substance that contains all the nutrients that are necessary to sustain life. You may know a lot about honey, but if the honey just stays in the jar, we've completely missed the point. What Paul is talking about is taking the lid off the jar and tasting it, dipping your spoon in, spreading it on toast, even just putting the spoon in straight in your mouth. Not that I'd ever do that, of course. Then you'll know the honey. You won't just know about honey. You will know the honey because you are experiencing it for yourself. You're experiencing what it tastes like and what it feels like on your tongue. And you'll recognise it when you taste it again. That's what Paul's talking about. Have you experienced that? Not just knowing about God, but knowing what it feels like to have him in your life and allowing him to make a difference to how you think and feel and how you respond to challenges. Now let's look at verse 18. And Paul expands on this idea. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know. In the NLT, the New Living Translation, which I use quite a lot, it puts it like this. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light. And that really makes me think of a sports pitch, which is in the dark, but then they turn the floodlights on. Paul wants the most powerful light imaginable to light up every corner of this truth that we need to know. The light needs to come flooding in so there can be no doubt about it. Without light, our eyes are not much use to us. Without light, we're blind, even if our eyes are working. But the more light there is, the more we can see. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light, says Paul. 
that God will turn on all the floodlights so you can see everything as it really is and not just the unclear shadowy outlines that you could see before. Because when that happens, you'll find that you're able to hope. You'll find that solid foundation that you're yearning for and you'll be freed from fear. And then he goes on in verse 18 to say that by knowing God better and by having their hearts flooded with light, then they will be able to know the hope that they have. So what is this hope that we keep talking about? We've defined it in different ways over the weeks. It's the goodness and reliability of God's character. It's our identity as his people who he loves and who he will not let down or abandon. It's our relationship with him, which is founded on Jesus Christ, the most secure of all foundations. It's knowing that this life is not all there is and God's purposes are much greater and we are held within them and they will be fulfilled. I think I also want to add to that list today that our hope is the new thing that God is doing. Because God is always doing something new and we can find hope in knowing that whatever may come to an end, it's never the end and that whatever has been changed and lost will be replaced by the new growth of something new that after the winter the spring will come that God will finish what he started he'll finish the work that he started in us and he won't abandon us halfway through whatever our difficulties there are always the green shoots of the new thing that God is doing, if only we have the eyes to see them. You may know about this kind of hope, but do you know it? Do you know it like tasting the honey? And can you apply it to what is unknown and unseen ahead of us? And does that knowing it change how you feel and think and respond to things. We need to understand who we are and what we have. That's the knowing that Paul's talking about and without it we cannot be the people that God wants us to be. So I've got three questions to finish with that you can think about for yourself. Firstly, what one thing could you do this week that would help you to know God better? That may mean starting something or it may mean stopping something because often our inner lives are full of clutter and distractions. It may be that you just need to listen more. It could be just as much about stopping as it is about starting. But what one thing could you do or perhaps not do, that says to God, this is because I want to know you better. I'm, a, I'm really aware that some of us are really struggling to feel connected to God at the moment. It's a difficult time. And the last thing I want to do is to pile more guilt on you. If all you can pray is, God, I want to know you more. That's enough. Keep praying it. He will respond. Second question. How good are you at the wisdom bit? At applying what you know about God when difficult situations come along? Is there a step of applying that you need to take to put into practice in a real situation in your life? And finally, what new thing is God doing? that you need to open your eyes and see? What green shoots of newness have you been missing because you've been so distracted by other things? And from this passage in Ephesians, as I pray for you, as I will, I'm not gonna pray 
that all your troubles will end or that you'll have a comfortable life. I'm not going to pray that God will double the size of the church. My prayer for every one of you and for you as a church, Mutley, as you go forward now into whatever God's got for you in the future. My prayer is this. I will keep on praying for you and asking that our God and Father will give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may come to know him better. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can know and understand the confident hope that we have in him, your identity as his beloved and precious children and the power that he has to act and that we also have in him. May God bless you and keep you all. Amen.